thank you, Cahirlik, and thank you, Minister. And I do want to commend you for keeping to your word and, and coming back here on a quarterly basis. And I think it's a useful exercise to do that in terms of evaluating on, on where we are. But it doesn't fill me with confidence, and it would still appear to me that the tail is, is wagging the dog in terms of the insurance uh, industry. And I do think that the insurance companies are continuing to laugh at us. I think they have, uh, it's quite obvious that they appear now that um, they've got away with it, that we had all our consultations, we had all our examinations, and things go on business as usual. And I suppose the bottom line in evaluating all this, and it concerns me when you um, almost congratulate ourselves on the stabilisation of the market, which the market had gone, the prices were gone so extortionate as they were that, you know, saying that we have stabilised at that I think is an abject failure and it shows a, a complete market failure there that needs to be looked. We need to be looking at the reversal. And in all of the people that I'm talking to um, that um, have uh, got insurance premiums of late, they have all increased. Nobody, there isn't one single person I know who've had their insurance reduced. And in all of the work that we did last year, I'm seriously concerned that that is not having some impact, not sta sta stabilisation, but reversing. And I am concerned about the setting up of the forums. And I know what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve, but I think it's all almost putting more obscurity into it and it's certainly not making things more transparent. And the whole um, ethos of running through the report uh, that we did in the insurance report was that things would be more transparent and people would see what was happening. And I do think in the first question I want to ask you, Minister, have you given serious consideration to, um, to examining properly the different models and to running almost a parallel system where we give serious thought into the different models, um, or at least introducing a state-backed rival offer competition, looking at maybe the New Zealand model, um, which has no a no-fault model with a compulsory scheme for personal injuries, or the Australian model where compulsory third-party insurance is included in the vehicle registration, or uh, others such as in Quebec in the public insurer manages uh, the insurance regime, regime for the bodily injuries only. So that's my first question, because I think we've given enough time to the insurance companies to show some kind of a gesture in reducing their rates, and they have failed to do that so far. Uh Thank you very much, Senator. I mean, I, I know that we all have anecdotes, and I have an anecdote myself of someone whose premium went from 1,500 to 1,060 euro just a month ago. So the anecdotes go in either direction. I think it's important that we try and work off the data because it was the data from the CSO that you know was was giving us a you know a concrete indication of exactly what we were hearing from our own constituents in the course of last year and the year before. Um, stabilisation isn't failure. Stabilisation is progress. We need to stabilise the market first before we can then start to drive down premiums to a fairer level. We're trying to move away here from the super cycles that we saw in the past that saw people paying very, very low premiums, so getting very, very cheap car insurance, but at unsustainable levels for those companies and for the industry as a whole. Now we've seen it you know, uh, rocket back in the other direction, and we don't want that either. So yes, uh, costs are stabilised. They're down about 6%, I think, since last, January, uh, last July. That's not good enough. This is only the beginning of our work. These actions began, the work began sometime before Christmas, um, but I think it's positive that we're starting to see results. Not all of it is because of the cost of insurance working group, let's be quite clear. The increase in rates uh, by the Fed in the US has had an impact in terms of the bottom line for some of these companies, in terms of the investment returns that they are making, and that is helping in terms of their profitability. Um, so there are a number of factors that are building into this. Insofar as the characterization of the tail wagging the dog, I mean, I just want, I want to be clear on this. You know, to be fair to the insurance industry, because there has been a change in attitude since when you began your work on this committee in relation to the cost of insurance, and we began our work in government. And I think the public engagements that have been had, not just in this committee, but also in the media, have been very helpful for that as well. But what we are trying to do is to work with the industry. They are now responsible for a number of the actions in the report. Um, the department takes the lead ownership, but we are working with them to get them completed. And as we get them completed, this will mean substantial reform of the insurance sector for motor. I think that's very important. You mentioned the forum, and we've, we've had our first meeting, and that brought together some very key actors in this together into a room for the first time, so I think it was important to do that. We're going to expand out that forum uh, to more participants. But I, I have to reject that idea about this getting more opaque and, and there not being transparency. 
if you look at what we're doing with the quarterly reporting, how we are updating you in terms of the, the specific actions that we completed that quarter, but also an update as to progress under the recommendations as well. Um, that's transparency that we, we really haven't seen before. You've also got the person responsible for implementing that action and the person responsible for overseeing the implementation of that action. And those reports come back to me and my committee, which I chair, on a regular basis, and then we present them to you on a quarterly basis. And even in advance of the first quarterly report, I presented an interim report to the committee to show you that work had already commenced. Um, so yeah. Minister, what it is is that the actions, and I don't say that you, you, know, you are doing good work around this, but the actions aren't uh, reducing the impact of the higher rates of insurance. We're going to do that uh, immediately, and Senator. And I, was, well, I was quite clear that they were never going to do that immediately. That what we had to do was to, to put together a very comprehensive plan to have buy-in from the Iraqis and government. So people were, were clear that this was going to happen. This wasn't going to be reports. You see, you see the like problem this. I have is that when I'm confronted with this by constituents, mm. um, you know, every every week, it's like. Me saying to them that we have a plan and the minister has a plan and the minister, you know, believes there's more transparency in it now and, uh, you know, things are going to change. They will ask me, well, when is it going to change? When is my premium going to come down? And I suppose maybe that's the, the question that I'm answering, uh, asking you here today. And there's no point in me saying to them, well, the data says that, you know, there's 7% reduction. Yeah. We so need to break it down for people to make it relevant for people. Yeah. Senator, and I, and I get this myself, and people, I mean, I have become something of a focal point for people giving out about their insurance premiums. You know, if I'm at a wedding or something, it's, hey, my insurance, and they come up and they give me hassle, and it's a great time. Um, but I understand that, and I understand that um, it's difficult to explain what's actually being done, because we always said this was a complex problem, and it required a number of things to be done across a range of fronts over a period of time to actually solve it. Um, Stabilisation is a positive development. We hope that it continues, but we've got to be you know, vigorous in making sure that we complete all of these reforms. And what we can say to people is that you, you know, we are in the middle of doing work that will result in fairer premiums for those customers, um, but it's not going to be overnight. And we have to be clear about that, I think, with our constituents. This work is being done. Can we give them an indication of, say, by the end of this year, uh, premiums will have come well, down? The current hope is that the, that the trend that we have seen down since last July, which is 6% now, will continue through the course of this year. And what that would mean, say for someone who might have renewed their policy in the last month, in 12 months' time they should notice a reduction in their premium. And I'd be amazed if they don't. Because these reforms are being done. Because other things are happening in the wider market which are a benefit to the insurance industry, not just the satanic judgment, but in relation to yields from investments. Then in 12 months' time, everybody should, or almost everybody should see, a, yeah, but you I know, can't speak bar things remaining the same, say, and I understand yeah. that there are some variables within, um, uh, within the I mean, uh, insurance There are many variables in terms of the pricing of an insurance yeah. policy that a, an insurance company would use. And it's very difficult to say to an individual case, mm. oh, your premium should have gone down. You know, when people sometimes bring up an anecdote, as we did in the recent debate on the door, and they said, I know a person, and this happened to them. I mean, we can't fully know all of the full circumstances of why an insurance company might decide to price the risk in the way that they have done. But I would be amazed if we were seeing still the kind of reported anecdotal jumps that we are seeing in insurance policies that we are hearing at the moment still, um, where there has been absolutely no change in circumstances. And again, I mean absolutely no change in circumstances. Um, and it's not always clear to me the cases that are brought to me individually, I don't always get all of the information. When I start to dig beneath the surface, a couple of things then come to light, which you might understand the insurance company might have decided to change the risk pricing on. Right. I just want to move on. I hope you're not, a, I hope you're not amazed in, in, in 12 months. There's a couple of just specific things I want to ask you, and one is around Recommendation 3, which extends the current renewal notification period from 15 to 20 working days, and that that requires a consultation paper that won't be ready until quarter four of this year. Uh, and that any resulting legislation could take another six months. Isn't this just an example of putting things on the long finger? Does it really require a consultation paper to increase from 15 to 20 working days? Well, the central bank is, is responsible for this action, um, and there's a number of things that we need to change around what the central bank, uh, or there's a number of changes that are going to be made by the central bank, and so they are progressing this, I suppose, as one. We have to go through due process. There has to be public consultation on these changes. There are certain timelines that are already there in place that have to be followed. What I would say, I mean, I think this is a good thing to do, um, but it's, it, by no means is it the most important thing that we have to do. Um, you m might have heard, as I have heard from people, 
again anecdotally, that where they have shopped around in the two-week period that they currently have, they have gotten a reduction in, the, in, in, in terms of the first quote that they have gotten. I'm hearing that a lot at the moment. So there is competition in the market. People are getting lower premiums if they shop around. We want to extend that period just to give them a bit more time because, as you know, people are very busy. Sometimes they might not pay attention to the letter when it comes into the post in the first week and all of a sudden they find that they're up against it. This gives them just a little bit more space. Um, but these are the timelines that, that are there because due process has to be followed in the consultation. Will the insurance companies not just increase that as a gesture of goodwill? Uh, it just increase that to 20 days without having to go through all the, the, the hoops and things? I mean, one of the things that I wanted to do with this uh, piece of work was to put as much as I could on a legislative basis so that it couldn't and be that could unilaterally be done at a later withdrawn. Date. But, you know, just as a, as a gesture of goodwill, would they not come back with some of these things and say, look, we can fix it here? And that seems to me some just, just a very simple thing that could be fixed. What I wanted to do was to make sure that all of industry was moving together to make this reform so that it was, you know, then going to be on a legislative basis and that it couldn't be changed unilaterally by one company or by them all. Um, and this is the process that we're following with the central bank uh, leading on this work. I would ask that maybe you could go to the insurance industry and ask them to change that without trying to bring them all because then you're dictated to buy the slowest uh, uh, the, the slowest vehicle if you like within the within the system what dictates the timelines is the is a process that has to be observed in terms of changing legislation in this area so yeah you know, I know. but, but senator conway i mean you know speaking the to case. the better relationship that we now have with with the insurance companies mm -hmm. um and in light of the recent agreement that i think we've reached on the compensation framework which i think is a positive for them and a positive for customers I will, of course, make that suggestion to them, um, and I'll report back on what their answer was. Okay, thanks. I just want to ask you specifically in terms of the declined cases uh, and the system, because there seems there that there is still a lot of delay around that. So, for example, uh, one of my colleagues was contacted by a taxi driver seeking an insurance who had entered into the declined cases system, but was still waiting several months later for a reply. Uh, so how does a consumer know what their rights are under that agreement uh, and when they can expect to reply or a right to appeal and, and what, what's in place to improve the transparency around that particular uh, system? Senator, so recommendation 7 speaks to the client cases agreement and action 15 under that recommendation is on track. Um, Insurance Ireland has made the necessary alterations to its website to, in order to provide more prominent information in respect of the decline cases agreement on their home page and so people know that this is there and how to access that facility. You know, there's still a bit of opacity around this in terms of what's actually been happening and that's why in terms of our reforms, the first thing that we want from the insurance industry is a report exactly on what has been happening with the decline cases and that report is one of the actions and it's on track for completion before the end of the second quarter. So by the end of June we'll have a detailed report exactly on, on how that's been operating so we can then look to see what needs to be changed. Okay, for somebody who's in that system at the moment, what can they do? Well, there's a, uh, if they go to the website, they'll find the, the, the appropriate either email or phone number to call to then go into that process. Again, it's not operated by the government, um, but it is there for them to access. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, if, if you have particular cases, it's something that the department is happy to do, is to pass people on to the relevant person so they can then access the, okay. the system. Yeah, and this is very finally, and this was, it's just around the, the, the privatisation of the policing, the specialist guard, the unit. I am really concerned about that, um, that it seems to be on your agenda, and I think it should be rejected. And it really reminds me of the whole situation with Shell and the Gardaí and the, the, the force that was used for them, and I absolutely would, would be appalled by the thought of... Um, privatising the policing and are allowing the, the industry to, to, if you like, rent a cop, which was allowed to do in the, which was allowed to do in the Shell case. So maybe you just, just explain to me how Give you an update, Senator Conway, on where yeah. we are with this recommendation, which is recommendation 26. So um, what this recommendation requires is on Garda Corner to determine before the end of the second quarter of this year whether there's a mechanism for further cooperation with the insurance industry in relation to fraud investigation. With the agreement of the Garda Commissioner, the Garda National Economic Crime Bureau, within the Garda, on Garda Shikona, they have engaged with Insurance Ireland with a view to examining a proposal that Insurance Ireland will provide funding to set up a dedicated investigative unit within the, within the GNECB to focus exclusively on the investigation of insurance fraud. 
and they have visited a similar unit in the UK to assess whether it's a viable option for Angarda Shia Kona. So this happens in the UK and it happened successfully. If it's deemed possible from an operational perspective to establish such a unit, the proposal will be submitted to the Garda Shia Kona for consideration. Uh, the Department of Justice will then be consulted and will consider the broader issues arising before making a decision on the matter. And the current position is that the GNECB has provided Insurance Ireland with estimated costs associated with the establishment of such a dedicated unit, which will be brought before Insurance Ireland's non-life council meeting in June for a decision as to whether the proposal will be submitted to the Garda Commissioner for consideration. And that's the update at the moment. This decision will not be made by me, um, but we're still working through whether or not there is an actual recommendation that can be made to the Minister for Justice. Okay. Yeah, are, you, are you proposing that, Minister? Uh, at the moment, I, I, what I propose in the report is that it be investigated as to whether or not it's possible or, or should be pursued, and that's what we're looking at at the moment. I have grave concerns about that. I understand that. Grave, yeah. grave concerns about yes. it as well, I like, absolutely. I mean, as I said to Deputy Doherty in a previous engagement, this is something that we will have to debate and look at very carefully if it is to be proceeded with. It won't be a decision made here in, in committee. It will be a decision for the Minister for, for, the Minister for Justice. Excuse me. And I, I anticipate that some people will be uncomfortable with this. What I would say is that it has worked in the UK, and um, it hasn't had that impact that you are afraid of in terms of buying a cup at all because of the way in which the funds are ring fenced and the way of which, you know, procedures are put in place to separate completely out the insurance industry contribution and the actual work being done by the fraud unit. But again, we are still working through this proposal. Yeah, but I mean, you know, that would that what what is what it leads on to as well. I mean, can we get a philanthropist to fund? Um, um, you know, a police service that's going to investigate corrupt politicians. You know, it's. Uh, I, I mean, just think it opens a can of worms that is, Senator, is way beyond. I understand the concerns, and if this becomes a proposal, it needs to be debated in full by the Dáil and the Shannon. Absolutely. I had one other question.